wonder what the real need for the gospel is in Wichita. Isn't Wichita in the Bible Belt? However, Kansas, and in particular, Wichita's relationship with evangelical religion is more complicated than this blanket statement suggests. By the early 1990s, Kansas was gaining national attention on issues from abortion to homosexuality to evolution, which appeared to confirm a reputation of Kansas as a conservative state populated by religiously motivated activists. How is it that a state that once endorsed the pragmatic republicanism of William Allen White Alf Landon and Dwight Eisenhower was now known for abortion protest, teaching intelligent design in science classrooms, and the anti-gay spectacles of Fred Phelps of Topeka's Westboro Baptist Church. Welcome to Kansas History, a Journal of the Central Plains podcast, a collaborative project of the Kansas Historical Foundation and Department of History at Kansas State University. I am your host, Lisa Kaitlin Highsmith, and today I am joined by Dr. Jay Price, who will be discussing his article, Assembling a Buckle of the Bible Belt, From Enclave to Powerhouse. Dr. Price is chair of the Department of History at Wichita State University, where he also directs the local and community history program and the Great Plains Studies Certificate Program. He has authored and co-authored several photo histories of Wichita area topics, including Arcadia photo histories. His other projects have covered topics from ethnic entrepreneurship to religious architecture to local rock music. He is currently leading a team of students and artists to tell the history of Wichita in the form of a graphic novel trilogy. Hello, Dr. Price. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for the opportunity. Glad to be here. So, Dr. Price, let's start with explaining the journey that led you to this topic. The interest I have in religion has always been something that's been part of my life. Initially, it began as an interest in uh, religious architecture. And part of it was me growing up in the Lutheran church and wondering why when we traveled around, it seemed like all the other churches got these beautiful Gothic revival structures and if you wanted to find the Lutheran church anywhere, you look for the ugliest 1950s modern church you could possibly find. And I always wondered, well, why was that? And so that started me on a journey of looking at religion and architecture, but also looking at religion as a cultural and social phenomenon. That led me to a study of religious architecture culminating in a book, Temples for a Modern God. And in the process of working on that project, I delved into a number of local archives and also denominational archives, and I realized there's this deeper, more expansive story that needed to be told as well. You introduced your article by describing the Summer of Mercy in 1991. What was this? The Summer of Mercy was a, initially meant to be a fairly limited period of activist protest uh, regarding uh, abortion. And it was meant to call attention to abortion practices, particularly those of individuals like Dr. George Tiller. It was a collaborative venture, if you will, uh, between a number of different uh, anti-abortion groups, both in Kansas and nationally. But as it unfolded, it became a, a media event and then really culminates in a major rally that takes place on WSU campus in August of 1991. And in many ways, it's seen as a, a shift, as a bellwether for Kansas social and political dynamics. You mentioned Kansas and Wichita being at the crossroads of a region. What do you mean by that? And why is it significant? Well, Wichita State in Wichita, Kansas, is really located at this intersection of region. Kansas in general, Wichita in particular, seems to be at that unique spot where the North and the South and the East and the West and the Southwest and the Great Plains and the Ozarks all come together. And we bear elements of all of those different regions. You said that until the 1970s, Kansas and Wichita were Midwestern in terms of religion. What does that mean exactly? Scholars who look at religious demographics and region 
have noticed a number of trends that different parts of the country have different religious traditions more influential. And for the Midwest, that is a mixture of immigrant ethnic traditions and mainline Protestant traditions, particularly from the northern part of the country. So, for example, uh, you're going to see large numbers of Catholics, Lutherans, but also Presbyterians and Methodists and so forth. Our institution here, Wichita State University, began as a Congregationalist school of Fairmount College. And so if you look at the Midwest, which is itself a murky concept, religion tended to have these different ethnic and mainline, northern mainline Protestant groups. And those tended to be the main dominant groups population-wise, but also in terms of influence. So in a place like Wichita, the Methodists, particularly the northern Methodists, were a major, major factor in our local life. The northern Presbyterians, the northern Baptists, and certainly the, the Catholic Church is part of that conversation, and they tend to be German Catholics. So if there's an ethnic tradition, you're going to see German Catholics, German Methodists, German Lutherans, German Mennonites, and uh, certainly the Jewish community has elements with that as well. But it, it's different than the more evangelical traditions that we tend to see, for example, in the South that had developed in the late 19th and early 20th century. What happened? Why did this change? A lot of it has to do with demographics as a whole. One of the things that was very striking when I started looking at the Baptist records was that in the 1900s, the early 1900s, Baptists in Wichita were Northern Baptists, American Baptists. There were no Southern Baptist congregations in this city in the 1930s and earlier. The first Southern Baptists arrived during and after World War II. Our first Southern Baptist congregation uh, is founded in 1945. And so after that, we have an influx of Southerners coming into Wichita, working for the aircraft industry and elsewhere. And so you have a much larger body of people of Southern extraction here. That's an initial shift. Then we see a national shift going on where mainline Protestant groups start declining in energy and influence. This happens in the 1960s and 70s. And evangelicalism, especially Southern-inspired evangelicalism, starts to emerge as a national conversation in places, especially outside of the South, places like California and so forth. And those groups then uh, tend to be more in the ascendancy, and we start seeing that shift. So there's a blending of people of different regional background coupled with a religious tradition. So by the 1970s, we're seeing two things. We see the influence of people of Southern heritage and their descendants as a growing segment of the Wichita population. And we see Southern-oriented evangelical traditions emerge nationally as a realigning influence in national religious demographics. And so those two trends come together here in Wichita. Who do you believe are some of the most influential figures in this change? Uh, a couple of really influential figures are a number of individuals who are part of this. But more specifically, I would argue there are a, a number of key congregations. And so, for example, Metropolitan Baptist Church is, is one of them. Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, is, is another. You're also seeing a number of new groups, especially from the Pentecostal tradition, coming in as well. So you have those individuals emerging as more visible parts of the landscape. And then by the 70s and 80s, you start seeing more activist figures, people like John Click for example, in the Baptist tradition, and others giving voice to a more evangelical worldview um, compared to just a few generations earlier. Um, one of the things that is striking, if you compare the, the role of 
Southern Connected Evangelicals in Wichita in the 1940s, when we had a big discussion about getting rid of statewide prohibition, they were vocally in favor of keeping prohibition, and it doesn't pan out. By the 1970s, a number of issues are able to draw people together. Um, one of the first of the big ones in the late 1970s is a protection of today what we would say is LBGT. Um, that wasn't the phrase they exactly used in the 70s on the part of the city commission. That sparked a resistance on the part of a number of individuals, especially in the evangelical community, that organized a vote to overturn that on the part of the citizens of Wichita. So how does this all tie into politics? You can change people's mind one person at a time. You can hand out pamphlets and leaflets and so forth. But it's on the political stage where we see these movements gaining greater visibility. In some ways, it's also a shift in how our politics has unfolded. In the middle of the 20th century, politics was about working together, maybe cutting deals, maybe backroom deals, but you didn't wear a lot of your ideology on your sleeve. You, you definitely had a partisan attitude, but then there was this sense that things were kind of worked out out of the camera light. From the 70s on, we see this visible use of media as a way of rallying big movements. And politics becomes an expression of identity. And so groups that can tap into that and can tap into media to mobilize things gain a great deal of attraction and visibility. So it's and an element, the medium is the message, the medium of politics allowed a number of these issues to come into the fore. Where do you see us today? Do we need to rethink regional identity? Is it becoming something else? That's one of those questions I still wrestle with. Part of it we have to remember that regional identities are artificial concepts. So they are framed at different times. I do argue that regional identity is something that changes from time to time. And so where really is a matter of when? There was a point in this city's history through the early part of the 20th century that this city was 125% convinced that it was part of the Southwest. We become more identified as a Midwestern city in the middle of the 20th century. So those types of fluidities come into things. I think our discussion of the Midwest emerged in the 20th century. Uh, initially, James Shortridge talks about this. Uh, it was initially it was a horizontal designation. It was the mid Northwest, Northern West, the Southern West, and the Middle West, which meant Kansas and Nebraska. By the turn of the century, Midwest tends to mean the Great Lakes and its extension from out of that. So in the orbit of Chicago, I guess, is a way of thinking about it. But that world is changing now and looking at religious demographics very much plays into that. And so if, especially if you look at the edges of region where the South and say this Midwest or Great Plains region meet and we're right there. That's something we need to kind of unpack. So what do we mean by this? There are two approaches. One is to say the Midwest itself is shrinking and that religiously, for example, Wichita in 2000 looks a lot more Southern. In the 1970s, we looked more like a city like in Iowa or Illinois, Wisconsin, and so forth. Now we look more like a city in Oklahoma or Arkansas. So that might be one direction. Another direction is say, well, how do we incorporate evangelicalism as a Midwestern expression? And so we might see it more as a sense of redefining it. And the third way is saying we have, it's a both and. We're both Midwestern and more Upper Southern now. 
And then we could even start with talking about the dynamics of the so-called Bible Belt. And that itself is a very fluid concept. Part of the challenge of the Bible Belt as an identity, although the term goes back to H.L. Mencken in the 1920s in the Scopes trial, as a regional concept, the Bible Belt emerges in the 1970s. And so it looked at a very specific set of parameters where evangelical religion was prominent. But the thing is, that landscape doesn't look like the landscape today. Evangelicalism in Kansas and in Wichita was still a minority religion in the 1970s. In the 2000s, that's a different conversation. They're much more visible. They're much more prominent. They're much more influential. And so knowing how we're different from the 1970s to the 2000s is part of that shift. It's very interesting that you say that. Personally, as someone from the Southwest, I would never have imagined Kansas to be a part of that. Well, and you're thinking about uh, Wichita as a Southwestern city. I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico, originally. So for me, Southwest has a very distinct cultural, culinary understanding. But Southwest, when we thought of it in the early part of the 20th century, meant greater Texas. Uh, Texas itself had a Southwestern identity, and we tied into that. So we're really thinking about Texas cowboys, not howling coyotes, when we say Southwestern in the early part of the 20th century. One thing we're probably still trying to unpack is the legacy of this. Evangelicalism of the late 20th century, early 21st century, was itself a cultural product. And so it came about generationally. And this is one other layer we really need to kind of think about. The 1970s was a countercultural era. You're nobody unless you're anti-establishment. It comes out of certainly the 60s activism. But we forget that evangelicalism also became anti-establishment. And so a lot of these groups and traditions develop by talking about them being against the establishment. And one of the challenges is that by the 1990s, the 2000s, the establishment of Kansas is shifting. The Summer of Mercy in 1991 emerged at a time when Kansas's political and religious dynamics still were Midwestern. They were conservative, to be sure, but there was a pragmatic, pro-business conservative attitude. You didn't talk about religion. That was a private thing. In the 1990s, that shifts. And so the Summer of Mercy is part of a, a whole family of events, everything from the attempted West Kansas succession movement of 1992 to the uh, election of Todd Teart um, and the defeat of Dan Glickman and the decline of, kind of that blue collar Democrat aspect uh, that you saw in aspects of Kansas. And so now I'm more evangelically, socially conservative worldview had supplanted that. And we're seeing that to this very day. Uh, you know, we're seeing this in a place like Wichita and maybe getting a little ways out of the religious side, but we see this in the sense of left of center liberal or however you want to frame these are really minor conversations. The real fight is between the pro-business Republicans and the more libertarian, more populist, more anti-establishment Republicans. And that's a product of this late 20th century, early 21st century worldview. And the challenge is that they've now become the dog that caught the car. And how do you be anti-establishment when you are the established? And as that demographic, as that generation can now establishes itself in leadership, uh, there are those who argue that really deep down our culture wars of the 1990s, 2000s were a civil war within the baby boom. And now as the baby boomers age and even the younger baby boomers are aging, What happens when the next generation who comes of age, who's much more ethnically and culturally diverse, um, who is, I have to say, a pox on both your houses to all the different array of political views, that's got to be interesting. 
the next generation, Gen Y, and really Gen Z is much more skeptical of big movements. One of the things you saw with evangelical Christianity is it was especially well designed to tap into baby boomer spirituality, where you're able to worship with several thousand of your closest friends, and you have this powerful uh, Christian rock that is very emotional, very personal connected. It's about identity. Who am I? Where am I going and things? And it also is inspired by very charismatic leaders who can give sound bites and things like that. The next generation's a lot more suspicious of that. So that might be a component. Another point is that Wichita is again shifting in an ironic twist. It's becoming more Southwestern again. If you look at groups who are of Latino descent, yes, we have a growing number of evangelicals in, in aspects of Wichita, but they're Spanish-speaking. And so what does it look like when we see Spanish-speaking evangelicals and Spanish-speaking Catholics as the new direction in Wichita? And that could be an entirely different conversation. Uh, but that's something that I think we need to be thinking. So what is next for you in your research? I've long said that topics pick me. I don't pick topics. I will always have an interest in religion and art and architecture and how that overlaps. Uh, there are always going to be interests in that aspect of it. In fact, I'm working on a couple of things with some anniversaries with some of the Episcopal churches here in town. But other aspects of the local community continue to, to develop. I was certainly working on this uh, graphic novel project, looking at the Chisholm Trail and so forth. More recently, I'm finding that the Latino community, the North End community, is having more of an influence on what I'm studying now. The ethnic entrepreneurship side of, of my research is coming into this. And so I, I'm not abandoning religion, but I am looking at uh, ethnicity and demography and those conversations and place, um, the built environment and so forth. But it's really coming more into the Latino community where I've seen some energy develop. Is there anything you'd like to discuss that I haven't already asked? You know, I think one of the things we may want to talk about with this, the role of Wichita in Kansas is itself a complicated conversation. Kansas evolved, if I can use that term in this context, as an extension of Kansas City and the Missouri River and the, the Kansas or Kauk Rivers. And so bleeding Kansas of the 1850s really was a di division between the Kansas River communities and the Missouri River communities and so forth. And so when people traditionally talked about Kansas in the 20th century, they really meant a 70 mile radius from Lawrence and Topeka. And outside of that, well, it was a region, it was sort of part of Kansas, but not really. And Wichita is absolutely in that. So the idea that Wichita embodies Kansas is itself a complicated discussion. So how reflective is Wichita of the larger Kansas scene? And I think we point to a number of trends that show up in some ways first in Wichita on a big scale and extend outward. Um, I also think that it shows how fluid our state boundaries are. I mean, our state boundaries are really artificial. They're just as artificial as regional concept. The border between Kansas and Oklahoma is a artificial one. And I've come to think of northern Oklahoma and southern Kansas as in some ways the same region. And Wichita is very much part of it. And so Wichita and Tulsa and Oklahoma City have some really strong connections with one another and each influences the other. And seeing us as that border area is useful as a technique. So just saying, oh, we're talking about Kansas and we make these nice, neat borders. I mean, that was one of the real problems with some of the regional identity discussions of the 70s, whether it was the Midwest or the Bible Belt or the Great Plains or whatnot, is they used these artificial state boundaries and said, well, everything in this state boundary now functions this way. But what if it doesn't? And what if it's a lot more fluid than that? So it's a good reminder that even within Kansas, we have these sub-regions that may or may not always interplay with each other. The other thing that is important, though, is in the late 1990s, early 2000s, Kansas 
has to pay attention to Wichita because of socially active evangelicalism and conservative Catholics. And we have to remember that the two work closely together. They're not the same world, but they work closely together. And they had an enormous influence in the state house in Topeka to a degree that we hadn't seen just a generation earlier. So from time to time, Wichita sort of burbles up and makes its presence known in Topeka. And the late 90s, early 2000s was one such period. How that unfolds in the 21st century is a case to be seen. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Price, for talking with us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks for listening. If you would like to learn more about the topics discussed on this podcast, please consider becoming a subscriber to our journal, Kansas History, a Journal of the Central Plains. Visit our webpage on the Kansas State University's Department of History website to learn how.